the rules of righteousness that come about are relegated to dumb when you consider why Christ came to earth. If you think of the picture of this perfect potentate who became flesh and dwelt among us, who dwelt among man, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and grace. Not just a Father, but the Father. Thank God that He is the only Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. From everlasting to everlasting, He is God. And we think about the coming of His Son to this earth. And it relegates all religious ritualism, all religious rules to where they're but dumb. That I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. Being made conformable unto His death. Christ Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. He's the express image of the person of God. For in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Of the triune Godhead bodily. Every bit of God was in Jesus Christ. The same word that was with God and was God is the same which was made flesh and dwelt among men. Right. He is the same one. In this epistle to the book of the book of Galatians, this epistle to the churches of Galatia, there's firm evidence of the fact that religious people, whether they be lost people or whether they be a regenerated, saved people, sometimes they often get entangled with the idea of going about to establish their own righteousness and therefore not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what this epistle is about. This is what he is dealing with. And this is what he puts this, this is the backdrop for which he makes this simple statement. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Yeah. Let me say, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. He's the end of the starting point of the law for righteousness. It was not by the law that he got saved. And he is the end of the staying place of righteousness. He is it. He, does, he is the one who keeps us saved. He is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He's the only wise God, our Savior, and he deserves glory and dominion both now and ever. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. You say, you're excited about this thing about Jesus Christ being everything. I am. I am glad that I do not have to work up my own righteousness. That I do not have to work out my salvation except for the salvation that He has already worked in to me and it works out. I am glad that I did not have to save myself. I'm glad that he didn't just pay part of my sin there. I'm glad that he has paid it all. Yeah. Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. He is the end of the law for righteousness. For everyone of that believing. To the Jew first. And also for the Gentile. Also for us who were outsiders. And were not. Uh, we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The truth of the matter is that it was up to me to save me. In me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do faithfully leaving our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There's nothing good about me. Come on. Now, I hate to have to tell you this. Y'all look good to me today. But there's nothing good about you. You can clean up your outside, but you still got an old deceitful heart. Come on. You can make yourself good looking, but let me tell you, when you get on the inside, there's not a good thing about you in your flesh. Come on. Your nature is rotten. Yes, sir. Your heart is deceitful. 
You say, preacher, I thought this was a Christmas message. This is why Jesus came. Because this is our problem. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I am so glad. And so are we so foolish as Christians? Are we so foolish as Christians that knowing that our life has begun in the Spirit, to think that we can now make ourselves perfect by the flesh? <coughs> Matter of fact, Galatians 3, 3, he asked that question, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, that are, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I mean, you think because you got born again that now you're able to do it? You're able to make it happen? That you're able to uh, keep yourself saved? I thank God for the song, Jesus paid it all, and they were all to Him I owe. Because can I say, if He had not paid it all, it would not have all been paid. Right. Because I have nothing to pay with. The wages of sin is death. And if I give up my life to, and die, guess what? An eternal death, there is nothing else, there's no salvation. Come on. But thank God that in Jesus Christ there is salvation. And there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is a sad sight, though, to see the beauty of holiness become the bonds of chains. And there is beauty in holiness. And there's happiness in holiness, too. There is beauty in holiness. Our holiness is a way of worship. It's not a work of righteousness. It is a way of worship. Our salvation from sin's penalty from sin's presence and from sin's power is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. And let me say this, He is plenteous in mercy. He is so plenteous in mercy that His mercies are new every morning and great is His faithfulness. My friend, it's the love of Christ that constrains us to holy living. If you do not live holy, it's because you do not love Christ. Now, that's cut and dry. The love of Christ constrains us to live holy. The more I love Him, the more I want to live for Him. The more I fall in love with Him, the more I want to live for Him. The more I fall in love with my wife, the more I do not want to go and do anything else except for with my wife. Spend time with my wife. Walk with my wife. Talk with my wife. Sit down and watch television in the, in the Hallmark movies with my wife. If I've got to bring you to a Hallmark movie, I want to do it with my wife. Amen. Amen. And she's worth sitting down and watching a Hallmark movie with. And if that girl you like is not worth sitting down and watching a Hallmark movie with, then my friend, you don't like her too much. Because you'll endure hardness as a good soldier. Huh? Hey, man, I'm not even preaching on Hallmark movies. I'm, you know, I, 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 uh, my, my, my. Grievous. The love of Christ constrains us to live holy. Say, why? Because we thus judge that one died for all and we're all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It's all about him. As we commemorate the birth of the babe in Bethlehem, let us consider him who suffered such a contradiction of sinners against himself lest we become weary and faint in our mind. He was more than just a babe in a cradle, but he was the, the blessed one who died on the cross of Calvary, on Golgotha's hill, in the place of the skull. He's the precious one who ever liveth to make intercession for us, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the context. This is the backdrop which the Spirit of God 
makes this proclamation. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them which were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Before I go further, let me just take a moment to teach us a truth that is often overlooked, but is most precious to those of us who are not Jews by nature. Those of us who are Gentiles by nature. He says Christ redeemed them that we might receive. Christ redeemed them that we might receive. I like that because of that truth of the matter is that even though we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, it was the law separated us from being able to take part of the covenants of Abraham. But he redeemed them from the law too. Oh, my friend. Uh, the law separated Jew and Gentile. But Christ brought the, the Jew and brought the, brought the Jew and brought them out of the bondage of the law so that he could bring us into the spiritual blessings that are in the Abrahamic covenant. Us who were without Christ. Us who were being aliens and from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers to the covenants of promise. Oh, my friend. We had no hope and were without God in the world. But now we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Being placed in Him who is our peace. And has given us access by one spirit unto the Father. I can now go in to the holiest of all. I can go access directly into the holy of holies. Thank God that our verses and our Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for both Jews and Gentiles. I'm going to preach on this thought a world. Uh, I'm just going to preach on this thought ready for redemption. Ready for for redemption. And I, I like it. I think of three things as I think of this. Of this, uh, when the fullness of the time has come. Just these three thoughts, and I will uh, linger there not long, but I will linger there for a moment and see if we can get something that will help our hearts about this being ready for redemption. There was a plan that was ready for redemption. There was a process of being ready for redemption. And there was preparation in this being ready for redemption. Let me give you the plan. The plan is redemption itself. The plan is reception itself. You'll notice this. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. I've already hit on this for a moment, and I may hit on it again. But within this plan, there is redemption and there is reception. And redemption is twofold. Redemption means to purchase back. And redemption also means to pay for something new. To purchase back. And to pay for new. To make it now. God purchased back his elect people, Israel, nationally. They are his elect people, nationally. They are God's earthly people. The church did not take the place of Israel. That's right. Israel is still a nation. And they are still God's people. Yeah. And God still has a plan for those people. They are his people nationally. For the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that was before he made us his people. That was before we were grafted in. But Israel was his people. They've been his people ever since he made a covenant with Abraham. And then with Isaac, 
And then Jacob comes along and he gave that covenant to Jacob. They've been his people. But often they've sold themselves out to bondage. Often they've sent them, God has sent them into bondage because they have sold out for sin and wanted to be like the other nations. And so he let them live in the other nations. And can I tell you, living in the world makes you sick of the world. But God purchased them back. But not only did He purchase them back, but He paid for a new people for salvation individually, both for the Jews and the Gentiles. In this, He took, he took of both the Jew and the Gentile and who come to Christ by faith and made us one new thing, a new thing, the church of the living God. For now, there is the Jews, and there are the Gentiles, and there is the church of God. And we're not to give offense to any of them. In all this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Right. He did it. He purchased us from the curse of the law that was written in our hearts. He cursed the curse of the law. That, we're, that the law has been in existence ever since Adam. But we didn't know it because it wasn't written down. But God gave one law to Adam not to eat of that fruit. And Adam ate of that fruit. And we had to be redeemed. We had to be purchased back. As all humankind individually must be purchased back. Nationally, it's them that's talking about Israel. But he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Chapter 3, verse number 13 says. Redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. Where it's Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. In Christ, this here Gentile believer has access to our great high priest. Through our great high priest. Into the holy of holies. Within the veil. I can go as far as any Jew could go. I can go as far, as a matter of fact, I can go farther uh, than um, Aaron could go as the high priest. You say, how can you go farther? I do not go in a type and picture, but I go into the holy of holies, in the heaven itself, where the throne of God is at. Right in the midst of the throne, I can go, I have access, I'm accepted in Christ. It's all in Him. My friend, I redeemed from the curse. Though I were far off as any Moabite has ever been, as far off as any Ammonite has ever been, or as far off as any other right has ever been. But I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. The law does not keep me out to the tenth generation. Oh no. The God, law has given me the opportunity for regeneration. It has been taken away. Nailed to his cross. As he hung upon the tree. There is no law of sin and death that is holding on to me. Oh, I have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus now. That guides me down a straight and narrow way. That leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake. Not a law unto death, but a law unto delight. Oh, hallelujah. A law of deliverance. Because I have a deliverer. I am redeemed. And I am received. Because there was a plan. But not only was there a plan, a plan of redemption, a plan of reception. But there was a process. God sent forth His Son. Now He tells us two things about the sending forth of His Son. How He did this redemption. How He does our reception. He gives us two things. And number one is by His sinless birth. Made of a woman. Made of a woman. Number two is by His sinless behavior. Made under the law. Made of a woman and made under law. You'll see his sinless birth. 
And you'll see his sinless behavior. We know that the sinless birth has to do with what I call spiritual genetics. For the Bible teaches us that the sin gene is passed by through the Father. Now, I do not say that women are not carriers of this gene. For if you look at your own life, women, you'd find out you carry the sin gene. Oh, yeah. Not one of you can say you're without sin. Oh, but thank God. It is not passed from the woman, but it is passed through the Father. That's, and let me say, science proves it physically possible for genetics to be passed from one parent and not through the other. Can I say, Scripture proves the other, the truth about spiritual genetics, that it's passed by the Father, wherefore as by one man sinned into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. It's by the Father's genetics. Passed from father to son and daughter. Passed from that father to the sons and daughters. And all the world has become sinful and unrighteous before God. Oh, but not this one. He was made of a woman. Oh, made of a woman. Thank God that God calls him the seed of the woman. That God calls him the son of God himself. For he was over, she was Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. And God moved in to her womb. And God had created the womb and they had given him birth. Oh God incarnate coming down to this earth. I thank God for the sinless birth. It was not that Mary was sinless. I will say this again. And I've said it often. Mary said, thank God for God, my Savior. Oh, God, she needed a Savior. Everybody needs a Savior except for Jesus Christ who is the Savior. And if it had saved himself, he could not have saved us. Mary would have been hopeless and helpless if Christ would not have been the perfect Lamb of God. The perfect Son of God. She was a sinner. For she had a, not just a human nature, but she had a human father. And because she had a human father, the sin gene was passed down. I do not care what the Romanists want to say. There was no immaculate conception of Mary. There was a miraculous conception of Christ. Hallelujah. There he is. A sinless birth. Made of a woman. And then there is his sinless behavior. This is the process of how he could redeem us. From the curse of the law. And receive us unto himself. How he could fulfill his plan was through this process. Sinless behavior. And it has to do with the fact that Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. Therefore, He can be made sin for us though He knew no sin. And we can be made the righteousness of God in Him. Never once, never once did Jesus allow Himself to have a bad spirit. He never allowed himself to have a bad spirit. He did always those things which pleased the Father. He was guided by the Spirit of God. He had the Spirit without measure. He was always obedient. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Sinless behavior. Let me say this. There was, there was a plan. There was a process and there were preparations. I think about in Jonah's day how God sent a great wind and how God prepared a great fish for the purpose 
to get God, to get God's servant to do God.